in. Um, if you have not already, feel free to still introduce yourself in the chat and answer our question of the day as we go through tonight's presentation. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Casey. I'm one of the program organizers for UX and ATX. And if you don't know, UX and ATX is a community of designers, not only in Austin, but all across the country. So thank you for tuning in wherever you might be joining us from. Um, if you do live in Austin, I did want to make one little announcement. We have an upcoming in-person social event in April that I just scheduled. We did one in January at Armadillo Den, and it was such a hit. It's so nice to get together in person after, you know, things were in lockdown for so long. So if you do want to come socialize with us, that is going to be on April 28th from 5 to 7 at Central Machine Work. So check out on Meetup. I just made the invitation today. Um, we're also going to have another learning event on the 27th. I have not made the meetup for that yet, but mark your calendars for those two days, the 27th and 28th of April. Um, so let me introduce our speaker for tonight. Oh, and by the way, you already noticed the recording started. Um, if that is not okay with you, you might want to bounce now, um, but feel free to leave your camera off. That's totally fine too. You're always welcome to ask questions in the chat. Um, our speaker tonight is Stephanie Sansusi, also known as Coach Steph, and she is a National Board Certified Health and Wellness Coach and the founder of Thrive Department, which is an executive coaching provider designed to promote growth, confidence, and self-mastery among creative leaders. So she has deep expertise in behavior change, along with specialization in coaching psychology, design leadership, and overall well-being. So Super excited for her talk tonight. She is going to talk to us about combating creative burnout and how to ignite your creative spark. So without further ado, Coach Steph, I will let you take it away. Let me stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. All right. Sounds good. Got this little screen, couple screens here that need to be moved. And All right. So hello, everybody. I appreciate you having me. Um, welcome. So I'm Coach Steph, and as she mentioned, I'm the founder of Thrive Department. So as an executive coach, my current focus is on promoting growth, confidence, and self-mastery among creative leaders. Now, before this, I spent the bulk of my career launching and leading world-class user experience teams while driving experience transformation. So with additional expertise in coaching psychology and behavior change, I have a few tricks up my sleeve for combating creative burnout, and I'm excited to share these with you today. So with that said, there are a few things we're going to talk about today, and the first one is really defining creative burnout. We'll look at um, defining creativity, and we'll look at other reasons why you might experience reduced creative capacity. We'll also talk about the benefits of creativity uh, that go beyond the artifacts that we create and how we can experiment our way back to a better place. And from there, we'll talk about habits that can boost creativity. So to start, we'll look at a definition for creativity. And this definition is from Shelley Carson in her book, Your Creative Brain. And I really like this particular definition because it starts to give us hints at ways that we can experiment our way to a better place when our creativity starts to wane. So creativity is the ability to take bits of information, whether from your internal store of knowledge, memories and skills, or from the external environment and combine and recombine that information into novel, original and adaptive ideas or products. So here we start to see this idea of bits of information, right? We can expose ourselves to new ideas. In fact, I, I saw in the chat earlier, someone said, how did I get myself out of burnout? I learned a new skill again, experimenting our way to a better place. We can combine and recombine information here, kind of suggests, okay, well, maybe we can explore some new ways of thinking. And of course, a lot of this happens in our brain. So are there things that we can do to optimize our own brain health and spark creativity? So a few hallmarks of creativity. Um, the first here is divergent. It's divergent thinking. This is where we're getting into things like possibilities, novelty, complexity, um, perspectives, diversity of thought, and unusual associations. From there, we see ideational fluency. 
So what do we mean by this? Finding a large number of potential solutions to a creative problem. The greater the number of ideas we have increases the chances that we're gonna have a higher number of quality ideas. It's non-judgmental. We're not, we're not censoring here. We're not filtering our thinking. We're suspending our judgment. We want to be playful here. We don't want to push. We don't want to control. Um, those are the sorts of things that tend to squelch our creativity. So again, being playful is just one more hallmark that we're in the right place. And then it's imaginative. So we've got an open sky. We're dreaming. We're envisioning. We're asking questions like, what if? So with that said, we should talk about then now, what is creative burnout? Creative burnout is a state of physical and emotional exhaustion around creative work. And that last three words there is really the differentiator between creative burnout and classic broad burnout. So creative burnout shows up around creative work. And so here are a couple of hallmarks that we tend to find when we're reaching something along the lines of creative burnout. So, you know, we're approaching our creative work and we feel like our gas tank is empty. Our resources for creativity tend to feel depleted. Um, our spark dwindles, we start to feel stuck. We start to question um, what we're doing here and, and if we really have what it takes to be creative. Um, and what's interesting here is, you know, just a couple slides ago, we looked at these hallmarks of creativity and we think about the typical kind of corporate workplace. There are a lot of workplace factors that actually work against us when it comes to creativity. Um, you know, we talked about the importance of playfulness as a hallmark of creativity um, and having it be kind of open and suspending judgment. Well, in the workplace, sometimes our creative work gets judged. You know, we do have to have peer reviews. We do have stakeholders. We do have things that uh, need to get out the door and judgment is a natural part of that process. Um, most of us have supervisors and supervision and especially when we get into micromanagement can sometimes make it more difficult uh, to be creative. When we look at motivational factors in the workplace, it's primarily driven around extrinsic motivators. Maybe it's tied to salaries, bonuses, raises, uh, things of this nature. But again, it's on us to bring those intrinsic motivators to the party because it's those intrinsic motivators that are really going to get us to our, our best creative selves. And interestingly enough, when we think about the UX process, so to speak, you know, there is a, a bit of a, a linear connotation to that. And in some organizations, it's incredibly linear. And yet when we think about uh, creativity, again, it's very divergent in its nature. It is not linear. It is the opposite of linear. And so if our linear processes don't include enough space for that divergent thinking in play, it can be difficult uh, to maintain our creativity. And then the last call out here I want to make is a lot of these workplace environments are very artificial in their nature. Artificial environments, you know, think of your typical cubicle farm, you know, um, near a plant to be found. And yet we found that natural environments tend to uh, promote creativity. So with that said, creative burnout is not the only challenge we face when we're looking at something like reduced capacity for creativity. And so if we're sitting here faced with this symptom, it's worthwhile to take a second and just address the issue, right? This may be a situation where we're facing classic creative burnout Again, here, creative burnout focused really around creative work. You know, everything in life feels pretty good, but every time I approach this creative moment, I start to feel depleted. I start to feel a little bit of dread versus classic burnout tends to be a lot more broad in nature. Um, the good news is with both of these, the approach is very similar to getting out of that place. One can uh, innovate your way through that. Um, but then we get into this situation where depression shows up and depression also reduces capacity for creativity. And so if you are in a situation where you're really not sure where you sit, and there's a chance here that maybe this is crossing the line from creative burnout to burnout into depression, there actually is a test that you can take to get a sense of where you stack up. Um, 
And that is called Beck's Depression Inventory, B-E-C-K apostrophe S. And if you Google it, you'll find a couple of examples, but uh, that's one way to get a sense of, of where you're at. And if you find that uh, your score suggests that actually you're moving in the direction of depression, this is a good place where coaching probably isn't the right answer, but getting help from a physician or a therapist could be a benefit. So with that said, you know, creativity benefits extend beyond the work we produce. Um, here we see nine benefits that impact our own well-being. Uh, of course, when we're at our creative best, our energy is up. Our well-being is, is in a better place. Time tends to pass really quickly and we feel alive with our work and we tend to generate lots of great ideas. This is the sort of thing that sparks innovation. We feel like we get into the flow, judgment goes away, we let go of control, and we just appreciate the work we have in front of us. And so that gets us into this next topic, and it's really important one for creatives, and that is this idea of finding your flow. Um, how do you know when you're in the flow? You are totally absorbed in the work that you're doing. This is the sort of thing where once you're in the flow, you lose all sense of time you feel alive, you're in the zone, um, and you just give in to the work that you have going on. And I think we've all had experiences of flow at one point in time or another, whether it's through some sort of uh, physical activity. And here we see the example of, you know, somebody who's doing free climbing. In my case, it may be doing trail running on a technical trail. For others, it may be um, quite literally doing creative works, right? Whether it's playing music, singing, dancing, um, or, or doing some form of digital art, finding your flow uh, is not only connected with creativity, but happiness as well. And so with all of that said, I'd love for us to pause for just a moment and ponder this question. What has been your best personal experience with flow? So we'll think about that for just a moment. And for those of you who are note takers, feel free to write it down. And then in just a moment, we'll regroup and share a few stories. Okay. So would love to have a volunteer here. So tell us about a time when you've experienced flow. What has been your best personal experience with flow? Go ahead and raise your hand and Casey will pick somebody and we'll share experiences. Awesome. Okay, let's go with Rachel Sykes. Hey, um, hi, Rachel. I can turn on my video or if that even matters. I look like Garbaggio, so maybe it's not a good idea. I don't know. It's a um, safe space. Anyways. Yeah. So, so Rachel, tell us about a time when you've experienced flow. Again, a time where you felt fully alive and fully engaged. Yeah. So there's a couple different times. So in an example with like just creating in general, um, a time when I experienced flow was when I had to paint this apple for an art class and I just kind of became very obsessive, but I also have ADHD, so I got into hyper-focus mode. <laughs> and so I had a lot of creative flow in that, in that moment. And when I got done with it, people couldn't tell whether it was a picture or a painting. But like in my work, uh, a time when I experienced flow was uh, just having to come up with an idea for a campaign to drive adoption for uh, end users. And my brain just immediately went to like connecting all the dots. And then it, I landed on, well, our product helps people be ready for any situation. So be ready is what it is. And then I took that and I was like, it could be done this way and that way and this way and that way and this way and that way. And so, yeah, yeah. 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 So, you know, let's just take this story since it's sort of the one that we landed on. Right. So when you think about the challenge that was in front of you, how would you describe that? Um, are you talking about for in the work scenario? Sure. Yeah. Since yeah. that's the last one we spoke about. So in the work scenario, the problem in front of us was like 
I apologize for using the word like that was a filler word. Um, the problem in front of us was that we were challenged with the fact that people didn't know enough about what our product did or how it benefited their life. And so communicating that to the end user was the biggest, like I had to bridge that gap and then think about how can I make it sticky? How can I show them? How do I show them without saying it, but I still tell them, you know, how it benefits their life. I highlight on how it benefits their life. And then I just like created all these little maps of different things and different words that popped up in my head. And I landed on be ready because it can apply to so many situations, like be ready for the anniversary, be ready for the birthday, be ready for the unexpected, be ready, you know. And so that's how I I came to that conclusion. But that's just kind of like my brain going all over the place. So. Yeah. So when I think about this particular challenge, it's an interesting one, right? And it's one that really does lend itself well to flow. Um, you've got a complex challenge. You have lots of different variables at play here, but it sounds like it really used a lot of the skills that you bring to the table to bridge that gap. Yeah. All right. Rachel, thank you so much for sharing your story. Is there anyone else who wants to share a story? We did have one more hand raised. I think it was Michelle. If you're still interested, yeah, feel free to come off mute. Sure, thank you. Um, Hi, Michelle. So tell us about a time when you uh, experienced flow. Okay, well, um, since I'm also a painter, so I'll skip that one. Um, but also as a musician and singer songwriter, I experienced flow um, by, by playing patterns repetitively to, I guess, drop into flow. So there's something very, um, charming, I guess, to my mind uh, by doing that. And then through breathing in that process altogether, I'll drop in, I'll allow my uh, fingers to just kind of um, play around with different chords and different patterns within the chords. And then suddenly I'll find a simple uh, unique melody that I've never played before. And then that, and then that will kind of draw out the, the words to the song. That's kind of the process that I experienced. So, um, for me, there's something about at least musically, um, simple patterns of repetition to kind of like get me really into the present moment and then breathing and then just allowing myself to just play. So that's the process that I experience. Yeah, that's really interesting because it's a case where you're warming up to get into the flow. And so um, there's something about these repetitive patterns and our, our bodies love patterns, by the way. You know, I don't know if people are familiar with the idea of box breathing to calm our nerves, but there's something about patterns that our bodies love. Mm -hmm. And it's no surprise to see that that kind of helps you get into a mindset because as you talk about these unique melodies that you're creating um, through a few different mediums at the same time, it sounds like this is really a whole body and mind engagement, mm -hmm. uh, which is incredibly complex and requires a lot of skill to create something that's fresh and new. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing your story, Michelle. Thank you. Okay, so we've heard a couple of stories about flow and a couple of different commonalities showed up in flow. And I'm not really surprised because there are certain hallmarks of flow that we tend to see. So um, this diagram that you see here is from the psychology of optimal or flow, the psychology of optimal experience. And when we start to wonder where is it that we fly, find flow, if you look at the x-axis, uh, you'll see skills. And if you look at the y-axis, you'll see challenges. So we tend to find flow at the intersection of high challenge and high skill. Um, and what's not reflected here is we do need the time and the headspace for flow. 
Uh, otherwise, we will not get there. And so, you know, when we're trying to generate flow, it's important to start thinking about, okay, well, how challenging is this for me? Okay, well, how much skill do I need to bring to the table? Do I have enough time to really invest my mind into this? And, you know, in the example that Michelle gave, I love this one because it's also, and then how do I get my mind in a good place where I can really give my whole self to what it is that I'm doing? A couple of interesting call outs about this particular diagram is that towards the bottom, we see apathy and boredom. So apathy, we tend to see show up in low challenge, low skill areas and boredom actually does require a little bit of skill on our side, but the challenge isn't there. Uh, and so this also hints at some ways that we might be able to get ourselves out of this. So if we're finding ourselves bored at work, and by the way, being bored sometimes is okay. It's probably even good for you. Um, but if we're finding ourselves bored all the time, maybe the challenge isn't high enough and there are things that we can do to make it just a little bit harder for ourselves. And if we're finding ourselves approaching our, our work and our, our creative work, even with apathy, maybe there are ways to bring more skills to the project or a little bit more challenge to, to start moving that needle. So when we're at our creative best, I'll tell you, we've got our inspiration goggles on and we can look around and we see inspiration everywhere. However, when we're in a state that we're in creative burnout, boy, it seems like there isn't any inspiration to be found. And I love this quote by Jack London. You can't wait for inspiration. You have to go after it with a club. And doesn't that feel true when we have creative burnout? And so what is our club? Well, this club should be really familiar to anybody uh, working in the UX space because this is basically like UX for people. Insight to action, to insight to action, to insight to action. So the theory here is we can actually experiment our way out of creative burnout. So innovation methods, but applied to our own selves. So when we're talking about experimentation, there are a variety of contexts that we can play with here. So at the center, um, you can imagine this as being the self, right? You, me, whomever we're talking about. And we've got, you know, our minds and our bodies, our biology and our psychology. From there, we have our context surrounding us. And then within our context, we have all of these different social circles and social networks. And so starting with biology, there are a few things we can do here. And I think the key with this is we really want to nourish our brains. A lot of this work is happening there. And so, you know, there are things that can get in the way, you know, for example, sleep hygiene um, may seem like an obvious one to anyone who isn't sleeping very well, but there are some things you can do to improve your sleep hygiene. So uh, if you find that you're not getting enough sleep at night, you're not getting restorative sleep, darkening the room playing around with pink noise, white noise, various types of sounds, and maybe playing them all night long to see if it helps you sleep. Um, you know, not consuming alcohol close to bedtime, not eating too late, maybe stopping your food consumption three hours before bed. You know, they're having a consistent sleep-wake time during the week and weekends. These are all different things um, that one can do. I mean, hey, cell phones are tough, right? Maybe leaving it uh, somewhere that you can't play with your cell phone in bed can help improve your sleep and improving your sleep could potentially help improve your creativity. But this next one, exercising to nourish your brain is a really interesting one. So exercise optimizes your mindset. It encourages your nerve cells to bind and spurs development of new nerve cells. So there's actually a chemical protein, I believe, in your brain called uh, BDNF. This stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And basically this promotes neuroplasticity. It builds and maintains your cell circuitry. Um, in addition to that, we see that we have increases of monoamine neurotransmitters. So this includes things like norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. These are probably familiar to you as mood boosters uh, and also can be creativity boosters. Um, of note, by the way, BTNF is also great for learning. So we talked about this idea that uh, bits and pieces of information 
are important to our creativity. You know, in the example earlier uh, in chat where we heard about learning a new skill, if you want that new skill to really stick, you can boost the BDNF before you actually get in to learn that skill by doing a quick exercise session uh, before you jump into class. And then this last one we have is experimenting with nutrition. So this one's kind of interesting in all caveats, talk with your doctor if you have any sort of conditions that could be contraindicated with experimenting with your nutrition, make sure that um, you're in a good place there. Um, but if you don't have any contraindications, there are interesting studies out there around intermittent fasting and specifically this idea that intermittent fasting also induces BDNF signaling. So it's neuroprotective. Um, but beyond that, between say the 24 and 48 hour mark of a fast, somewhere in there, um, we see a boost in neuronal autophagy. So autophagy is essentially the process by which your brain, your not just your brain, autophagy can be anywhere. In this case, we're talking about neuronal hot, uh, autophagy, uh, basically cleans house. It cleans out all the bits and pieces in, of cell debris uh, to make room for more growth. And so um, again, this too is a neuroprotective uh, beneficial factor. So all things that could potentially be experimented with if you're looking to improve your creativity. So now we get into psychology. And um, you know, this is where we get into this idea, there's something about the pattern uh, that we talked about earlier with Michelle. So first and foremost, I, the call out here is taming frenzy. So what's frenzy? Frenzy is a case where like you're at work and you feel like your brain is going in a million different directions and you're overwhelmed and you're running from meeting to meeting and oh my gosh, what is going on? That's frenzy. And there are actually some strategies to taming frenzy. And in fact, I'll share with one with you right now that uh, has saved me for many a day when I've been on the mating train and I feel like I can't get off of it. So one technique for taming frenzy is called the STOP technique, S-T-O-P. Um, it's an acronym, stands for stop, take a breath, observe, and proceed. So what are we doing here? Well, first and foremost, okay, let's say I'm running to a meeting in exactly five minutes and I'm still keyed up from the last one I was at and I want to start this next meeting fresh. I've got exactly two minutes before I have to hop on the Zoom call. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna take a long, slow breath. Then I'm going to observe how I feel and put a word to it, an accurate descriptor. So I'm feeling overwhelmed. And then I'm going to let that go and I'm going to proceed to my meeting. So the reason that it's important to put a word to it when you make that observation and don't overthink it, don't try to, we don't need to control it or judge it or judge ourselves or judge what happened in that last meeting, it's just literally observing how you feel with a word as it kind of takes it from our emotional centers, now pulls it into our frontal cortex so that we are no longer hijacked from that emotion we were feeling before we get into our next meeting. And so this is one quick way that you can go about potentially taming frenzy as you're running through your workday without necessarily taking lots of time. And it's an interesting thing to experiment with especially if you're about to go in and try to do some creative work. So from there, we have fostering positive emotions. Funny thing about emotions is that negative emotions tend to stick like glue. You know, something rubs you wrong and it just bothers you the whole day. But when something good happens, it just kind of slips away like Teflon. And so what we want to do here is experiment with fostering the positive emotions, harvesting and helping to make them stick. Um, we can do this in one way by just one, acknowledging and observing when it happens. Did we have a creative moment? Did we have a spark of inspiration? Did we have an epiphany? Was there an engagement that just felt good? 
acknowledge it and like savor that feeling. Do you want to savor the feeling? And even better, if it's something you can share with somebody else. These are the types of things that help those positive emotions stick. Uh, this is a great one, not just for helping with creative burnout, but classic burnout as well. On Tuesday of this week, the University of Essex released findings from a meta-analysis they conducted to identify the most effective creativity enhancement methods for adults. And these next three actually sit into that camp. One of the things they called out was complex training. Uh, and that gets to this next bullet point, which is stretching outside of your comfort zone. You know, we spend an awful lot of our day just sitting on like a comfortable couch or chair in a 72 degree room, kind of doing the same stuff day in and day out. And so it's important to really make that stretch. Um, and complex training is one of many ways to do that. Um, but hey, it can be other ways as well. It can be uh, learning a new instrument. It could be doing some kind of physical activity, you know, I mean, maybe doing running at altitude or some other thing of this nature. Um, and also potentially exposing yourself to different cultural environments, for example, that maybe you don't spend much time in day by day. Next, we have allow your mind to wander. And in that University of Essex study, they sort of lumped this into the idea of meditation and open thinking. You know, most of our days we spend focused on something productive all the time. And even when we're not productive, we're still kind of focused on something. We're focused on, you know, TikTok. We're focused on a Facebook feed. We're focused on YouTube. Um, you know, or maybe even we're just focused on a conversation with a friend, which is great for you. Um, but it's not necessarily the same as unfocused, unstructured time where you can really allow your mind to wander. And if you're afraid you're going to get bored, the good news is the brain doesn't love being bored all the time. And so eventually your mind will start to wander. And uh, this is great for enhancing creativity. And then we have this idea of just taking a brain break. You know, again, we don't have to be doing something all the time. And we don't always have 30 minutes to allow our mind to wander. But in, you know, in an eight to 14 hour day of work, somewhere in there, you've got to stop or you wind up getting mental fatigue. And these brain breaks can really help with that, even if it's just five minutes to set everything down and have unfocused time. Maybe you could listen to music, maybe do nothing at all. Just take the break and allow your brain to rest. So our next tier here is social engagement. And this gets to that idea of exposing us to um, new ideas. So we can engage with others and hear their stories, hear their perspectives and ideas. You know, in the example of flow we heard earlier uh, with Rachel, it started off with a, a gap in perspectives. And um, here too, we want to appreciate and understand those opposing perspectives. It's not always easy to do, but if we can appreciate them, understand them, the important part of this is it might actually spark creativity in a new way. And then we may want to consider cultural immersion. This could include things like exploring the arts, exploring language, customs, perspectives, food, landscapes, or even volunteerism. And this in particular was a call out by that University of Essex study as well. And finally, we can experiment with context. And one of the things we can do is schedule flow sessions. It takes time. And if we don't make time for it, oftentimes we just don't get to experience flow and tremendous uh, creativity can happen here, but also tremendous joy as well. And so make time for it, schedule time for it. Um, if you're in a workplace situation where there's creative work involved and you are literally running from meeting to meeting to meeting, unless you bake out a little bit of time for flow, it's hard to get that done and can lead to a bit of creative burnout. But also consider tailoring your environment. And this could be making changes to your current environment. It might also be exploring what environments work well for you and spark your creativity. So maybe you can take your creative work and take it somewhere else. Try out a hotel lobby, try out 
a nearby park or conservatory. Maybe you could try a local art museum or a couple of different coffee shops and see what of these environments tend to spark your creativity. And from there, maybe there are some elements of that that you can bring back into your own space to help spark and nourish your creative soul while you're working. And then finally, get closer to nature. There have been some recent studies that suggest people spending time in nature tend to have more creativity. So uh, again, artificial environments aren't necessarily the best for this. And so either bring yourself to nature, or maybe there are ways that you can bring more nature to yourself. So with that said, you know, we've explored a lot of different ways that we can experiment uh, our way out of creative burnout. Um, but beyond experimentation, there are also some habits that we can adopt every day just to help uh, keep our creative juices flowing. So I love this quote by Maya Angelou. You can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. And if you can keep those creative flows going, they will continue to produce results. So, you know, first and foremost, make time for creative flow daily and load it up with some potential activities that are high challenge and high skill. And if you find you're having trouble getting into the flow, I would really look at that high, high skill, high challenge and see if there are ways that you can up it, not to the point of overwhelm, but to tip it over that edge uh, so that you can find the flow. It won't happen every time, but you want it to become more of a habit. So you can brainstorm a challenge. Again, if we're battling creative burnout, this does not have to be a work challenge. This can be a, a personal challenge or some completely different creative challenge. You know, for example, um, maybe you could brainstorm some ways to push your own comfort zone. Again, it's about creating a lot of ideas. They don't all have to be great, but maybe there's one really good nugget in there that you could give a try to. And then we can take brain breaks. So again, that unfocused time to reduce mental fatigue. And finally, move your body. You know, we talked about exercise earlier and, and how, how it really can enhance our BDNF and serotonin and dopamine and all of these uh, wonderful things. But honestly, it doesn't have to be even all of that. Just moving your body, walking around the block, for example, can help break that barrier as an everyday habit. Now, one thing to note here is we talked a lot about creative burnout. We talked about, you know, contrasting that to like classic burnout, but we didn't really talk about good old fashioned creative block. Uh, I would not put that in the same category as uh, creative burnout, but is worth talking about. So if we run into a situation where we have creative block, maybe we can unblock ourselves by asking a few questions. And here's just a couple of examples of questions. And maybe some of you in the chat could put some additional questions you might ask if you're trying to get past a, uh, a creative block. Um, but what are five wild ideas? You know, what would more creativity look like? What are three new perspectives on this? This one's kind of fun because you can kind of put on different hats and take on different perspectives yourself, or you could just bring three more people in the room and get some different perspectives. You know, what would make this more fun? Um, one that I really love is what does your imagination say? You know, this is about uh, getting through a creative block. And so you can let it go crazy. You know, there was one time I was working, you know, back in the day on a wayfinding app. I was like, okay, I'm really stuck on this. I feel like I have a creative block. And so I was like, okay, well, what if this wayfinding experience was in the ocean for moray eels? Like, why not? It's so ridiculous. But the whole point is just to get your brain to go in a completely different direction to break through the block and come back. Steph, it looks like we have a hand raised from Rachel. Can I pause you to have her come off mute? Sure, sounds great. Hi, Rachel. Hey, sorry. I was going to say um, one of the things I do for a creative block is I close my eyes. Mm. And then I just like start thinking out loud. And if I have to, so I don't forget it because I may forget it, I like 
put the recorder on just in case so I can just talk out loud and, and just and just think and just wonder. And that's actually how I, I came to the idea initially that I had with the uh, campaign because I went through, I don't know, 50 ideas before I came to that. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, and that actually brings up a good point too. Like we all think and learn in different ways. And so for those of us who tend to be visual learners, for example, maybe just drawing out different scenarios can be helpful. Or if you're a kinesthetic learner like I am, uh, getting up and like moving around while you're thinking about this stuff, walking while you're working through things, or, um, you know, maybe putting yourself into a new environment where you can spark a new way of thinking can help too. Yeah, even beyond these questions. I love the idea of kind of closing your eyes, right? You know, when you close your eyes, it's almost like your, your eyes still kind of move up into the direction of where you're thinking about things, but not everyone has to see that. <laughs> it's kind of a funny thing people do. But anyway, so a creative block, there are ways of getting around that too. Um, the creative block, fortunately, once you get past that, generally your enthusiasm is still there and you can kind of continue to move forward. Um, you know, creative burnout is something a little bit more pervasive and tends to cause a bit more dread when it comes to creative work. But uh, I hope after today, you've seen a lot of different uh, strategies that can be used for experimentation. Of course, one doesn't have to do them all at once. Just try one at a time and see what works for you. So with that said, I also wanted to offer up uh, an opportunity here. So if any of you have any, uh, you know, opportunities or challenges where you feel like coaching could be helpful, or if you're feeling stuck at all uh, on your path to achieving some goals that you've set out for yourself, I am actually offering a $200 discount on our prepaid three month starter package uh, to anyone who is part of UX and ATX um, between now and April 30th. Just make sure you mention that to me uh, when we meet up and there is a link here for you. And, uh, through this link, essentially what we would do is have a discovery call and we could talk through the challenges that you have and see if coaching is the best way to address that. So with that said, that is all I have for today. Casey, did you see any questions in the chat that we should no, answer? I don't think I've any, I've seen any so far, but if you do have a question, now is the perfect time to either raise your hand or type it in the chat. And I'm happy to read those out loud for you. Um, while we're waiting for some to come in, I would like to ask a question myself. So the whole BDNF thing is really interesting to me. And one thing I've just been really curious about lately is brain health and kind of how that plays mm -hmm. into yeah, getting into a good flow. So, okay, of course, exercise, we said, is kind of one of the main boosters of BDNF. Yeah, but I have a book. I have a book here on my wonderful shelf that you might love. Okay, uh, yeah. I don't know if you've read this book, Spark, by Dr. Uh, John Rady and Eric Hagerman. Um, but this particular book is all about exercise and brain health. And spends a lot of time getting into not only BDNF, but also some of the other factors at play uh, and addresses it in a lot of different contexts. It kind of goes beyond creativity and spends a lot of time talking about things like, um, you know, learning, but also like aging, hormonal changes, um, stress, this kind of stuff. It goes through a lot here, but if I wasn't sold on the benefits of exercise to brain health before this book, a hundred percent sold me on it. Okay, awesome. Great to know. Writing that one down. Any other questions for Steph? And Cindy just linked that book in the chat. Yeah, I see that there. Thank you. I'm curious. Okay, another question for you that I have, Steph. Okay. Yeah. So one kind of trend that I'm seeing a lot out there too, kind of connected to the whole brain health thing are like supplements or what they're calling like functional mushrooms, things like lion's mane and cordyceps and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, what's adaptogens and nootropics and all that yeah, stuff. What is nootropics, yeah, what's your take on all of that? Do you think that's like totally snake oil or do you think that supplements out there like that could be really used to like spark creative juices? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And I guess like 
te- like legally, I'm not a dietitian or all, <laughs> totally, you know, yeah. all of these things, but the science is actually pretty compelling around some of this stuff. And there is a lot of interesting research that's happening right now, um, you know, going even beyond adaptogens, right? Um, yeah. And into the realm of psychedelics. There's a lot of interesting stuff that's happening in this space. Uh, the study by um, University of Sussex, so or Essex, that uh, where they looked at all of these different factors that boost creativity. Uh, one of the factors they did look at it was actually like not adaptogens and nootropics, but drugs. And they surprisingly found, I actually found this surprising that uh, drugs are not an effective way to boost creativity. Interesting. At least not as much as some of these other factors. It did not shake out as a top, as a top dog here. The tops were really around meditation, um, uh, complex training, uh, and factors like these. Now that said, I mean, yeah, when I look at these adaptogens, like myself, when I'm looking at them, the research is always like, there's not a lot going on there. Do I take some adaptogens? Sure. Yeah. Because there's some research. <laughs> exactly. Know? I think it's um, just, yeah, a fascinating new thing. Yeah. Actually, a lot. yeah. you know, if, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Andrew Huberman out of Stanford University. I don't think so. It's uh, H-U-B-E-R-M-A-N. So okay. he has a podcast called Huberman Lab. He's a neuroscientist out there. He's a professor, uh, I think also at the ophthalmology department, super interesting guy. Every yeah. single podcast I've listened to has been absolutely fascinating, but he does get into a lot of topics just like these. Uh, and because his focus is on neuroscience, that is like the meat and potatoes of his podcasts, much like Tim Ferriss's podcast, his podcasts tend to be uh, really long, like an hour or two hours, three hours. But for me, I tend to listen to them when I'm working out. Super interesting stuff. So yeah. you would love it. Okay, cool. Yes. Very up my alley. So I'll check that out for sure. Okay. We do. Have I see a Victoria loves yes. him. I see. I know. I see some comments in the chat. Okay. I'm glad Jala knew what I was talking about. I know in snake oil, what an outdated term. Um, let's go to some of our raised hands questions. We've got Madison. Will you come off mute and ask your question? Certainly. Um, thank you. So I typed mine out, but I'll read it again. Um, so I'm just curious, what's the cap of stress and creative block that you usually experience before you either think about finding a new job? And have you ever been in the situation where you've been under either just personal stress or stress with your job and you've experienced a lot of creative block and you've had to make the decision of whether or not it's the workplace um, leading to that experience or if it's like your personal outside life? Yeah, you know, it's a really complex question, right? Because I think this goes Gosh. beyond the idea of creative burnout, you know, when it comes to deciding whether to stay in a workplace environment or not, you know, in a case of creative burnout, it's something that tends to be more temporary in nature, and you can experiment your way out of it. Um, you mentioned the workplace. And as I mentioned earlier, there are workplace factors that can get in the way of creativity. And because of that, maybe some of them can be tuned to get you into a better place um, or finding strategies and coping mechanisms for dealing with some of the challenges that you have in front of you. Um, so it depends on how you invested you are. You know, there are some times where wherever you go, there you are. And so you're in this workplace and now I have these problems, but now I'm in this workplace and I have these same problems. So it's super complicated. Um, but creative burnout is something that you can try things and see if it gets better. Now, when it comes to workplace, there's also challenges potentially around fit, around value matches, around um, you know, team dynamics and politics and other things that I think extend beyond the idea of creative burnout. Um, but suffice it to say, creative burnout specifically can happen anywhere to anyone at any time uh, and, and isn't always specific to workplaces. Um, if I was a leader of a creative team, however, I would say that it's important to look at those factors that could negatively impact creativity. You know, if you're sitting in a situation where you're looking to your left and you're looking to your right and everybody on the team has creative burnout, there's a sure sign that there's something going on in the dynamics of that team that isn't right. 
Um, it could be the UX process itself or the way the UX process is integrated with broader processes that stand out. Maybe there's not enough room or space for creativity. Maybe there's a micromanagement challenge. And so it's, it's just hard to get into the flow because there's somebody looking over your shoulder. Right. Maybe there are challenges um, uh, of that nature. Um, but again, those things can also be influenced by somebody. And generally a creative leader can do something about it. So depending on the relationships that you have with your leadership, um, just addressing some of those challenges can be helpful too. Thank you. So kind of an indirect answer to your question, but it's kind of a complicated question if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. No, it does. Thank you, Beth. Also, I would say that it helps not to run away from things, but to run towards them. And so as you know, if you're in a situation where like, gosh, you know, I just want to get out of here. Usually that's not enough. It's important to say, okay, what is it that I really want? Love that. Okay. I think we had another raised hand earlier from Michelle, if you want to ask yours, and then I will read one from Melanie in the chat. Sure. Um, has there, been um sorry my my kitten is distracting me oh <laughs> has there been any research that you've come across um because you've been quoting research from i think university of es essex mm -hmm. um, any research that you've come across um linking specifically play and laughter to move through creative block. This is one of those things where I'm going to say, I bet there is, but I can't point you actually to a very like specific body of research on this. I would have to go research it, but I am happy to grab a takeaway on it uh, and share it back with the group. Um, sure, yeah. You know, just... because because play and open thinking is such an important part of this, right? And our emotional states are an important part of this. Um, but no, I can't, I can't think of a specific study actually that's a, that, that links laughter. Yeah, just getting together and just play, being playful and just laughing and... Uh... Yeah, I mean, there are some studies that link play and creativity. Kind of like how kids, but yeah, well, children are they're living within their imagination and as their brains are developing, yeah, they play a lot and they, you know, hopefully laugh a lot. Um, I would bet by now somebody has like done some sort of like. MRI of this state to see whether laughter triggers the same brain states as creativity. Um, but I actually have not seen it. I want to ping Andrew Huberman and ask him <laughs> to, do, to do a two hour session on this because I would be curious about that as well. And I'll grab a takeaway to research this because yeah, for sure, I'm really curious about it. I mean, emotional states uh, can inhibit our creativity. So most certainly they can enhance it, no doubt. Uh, when you're in a state of laughter, you've got these, um, you've got these potential endorphins that are flowing, right? And there are connections between these same endorphins and creativity. So there must be a connection, but again, I, I haven't seen the specific study. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to read us one more question from the chat. I think that will be perfect timing as our last question. So this one is from Melanie. She says, since UX is still pretty new in a lot of organizations, we are not just practitioners, but also expected to be educators and lead engagement. Do you have any tips or tricks for keeping the enthusiasm up, the enthusiasm up when you yourself are starting to feel burnout? I find fake it until you make it might get you through the first session, but the rebound can be even worse. Yeah, yeah. So um, this it gets us a little bit outside of uh, the topic of creative burnout as well, but some of the techniques that we spoke about could still be helpful. 
Um, you know, and one of them for sure is this idea of resetting before we get into these engagements and really setting intentions every single time uh, so that you're coming into each one of these conversations fresh and with a bit of a beginner's mind. Uh, sometimes it can help to remember where you were at when you were new yourself and what it was like to be the person who was uneducated. Um, that can sometimes help. Uh, spending time in gratitude can help. This is something that I practice is daily gratitude, where I will literally sit down every single, every single morning and say, okay, what are three things that I'm grateful for? Um, and if, uh, if there's an area that I tend to be struggling, I will take a moment to find something I'm grateful for in that space to help rejuvenate my, uh, my own mindset around it. Um, you know, another thought too is setting intentions around how your day might be. So, you know, in the morning before you approach your work day, what are three things that would make today really great? And think about some of these conversations that you would have. You know, maybe it's not just the conversation you'd have, but the outcome that might happen because of those conversations. That may be something that could get you enthusiastic about the work again. Um, again, here too, when you're starting to feel burnout, there are usually a lot of factors at play and it may not be just these conversations that you're having, it's showing up there. And so again, looking at that whole context, looking at the biology, the psychology, the context, the social circles and say, are there areas here that I can experiment with again to lift my overall mood so that this particular context that it's showing up isn't so, um, isn't so tough. Is that helpful? Awesome. Yeah, I think that's great. Okay, awesome. Well, this was super fascinating, guys. If you are interested in continuing the conversation, feel free to go find our Slack link. I think Cindy linked it in our chat a little bit ago. We would love to keep talking about these kind of things and sharing knowledge and research and stuff with each other because, yeah, this is how we learn and grow as a community. So, Let's give Steph a little silent round of applause. Zoom hands. Thank you, Steph. That was super awesome. Really appreciate your time tonight. And everybody else, thank you so much for coming. Connect with us on LinkedIn and Slack. And remember to mark your calendars for the 27th for our next virtual event and the 28th for our in-person event at Central oh. By the way, I want to call out a, a thing in the comment from yeah. uh, Sherry wrote down a quote from me, a drug's not an effective way to boost <laughs> creativity. To be clear, that came from the University of Essex. <laughs> <laughs> let, let the record show. Let, yeah. let, let the record correctly. show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to take the heat for them. <laughs> exactly. Okay, well, thank you so much, Coach Steph. Everybody have a great rest of your Thursday evening and we'll see you at the next UX and ATX event. It's been fun. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Stephanie. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. All right, turning off the recording.